night and we are live. <laughs> Let me just walk over here. Hello everybody, hello everybody watching and you'll hear in the background Johan van Rensburg playing and he's joining us live um, on Facebook for the worship. So I think that's just awesome. So um, we're really going to enjoy this. So I have him on a live, uh, on, a, on a WhatsApp call here so we can communicate, but uh, you can see uh, well, you can see nothing, <laughs> um, <laughs> but he's, he's, he's um, in his live feed, he's in on our computer here, and uh, I'm going to switch over to him shortly. So it's just so awesome to be able to do this together. Thank you, Johan, for this. This is going to be great. So uh, you just said that the other day. Why don't we just try to combine the link and do everything together i thought that well that's a great idea so we kind of scratched our heads to make it work and here it is okay so thanks <laughs> so uh, just a few practical things well not really that practical i just want to say happy birthday uh, you all know my father-in-law johan vessels or vesi as everyone knows him but like a few are happy birthday is an amazing year on this liefer paar in uh, in was most party clank is most part so uh, happy birthday to my father-in-law everyone at church um, just send him a message if you have his number seek him out on facebook and just say happy birthday all right so we love you bless you and uh, we honor you in jesus name all right so i'm just going to pray for us and then we go straight into the worship with johan van rensberg how awesome is that so <laughs> so lord jesus we thank you for your awesome grace we thank you for your presence we thank you for your power we thank you for your goodness and we pray lord jesus that your presence will just saturate everything and everyone watching we thank you lord jesus for your goodness and your mercy to come to us lord let there be waves of mercy and waves of glory and waves of your grace we pray that the river of your life will come we pray that every heart will be revived and strengthened and and made new in jesus name in in this service amen so just enjoy it i'm going to switch over to you on and uh, it's going to be really really awesome amen
song just came to my mind. It's, it's a very old song. You might know it. Um, for those of you who know Julius Megan. It goes like this. <laughs> and I declare my love, my everlasting love. Yes, I declare my love for you, Jesus. And I declare Everlasting love, yes, I declare my love for you. Sing it out, oh, I declare my love, my everlasting love, yes, I declare my love for you. Sing it out from your heart, say, Lord, I declare my love. 
our love for you. We want to live in your presence, Father. Let your word dwell in us richly, Lord. We want to set our focus back on you. And we just love you, Father. We love your presence. We love your spirit. Amen. So you can keep on following on Christ Life Ministries. Over to you, Gerard. Be blessed. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Juan. Wow, <laughs> I need to almost f fight back the tears. <laughs> for <laughs> My heart was so touched by this worship. Wow, I'm so blessed. What a privilege, what a privilege, what a privilege. Thank you so much. Wow, okay, so... Um, Ooh, thank you, Jesus, for your presence. Thank you for your presence, Jesus. <sighs> okay. <laughs> so I'm going to read you a few scriptures for the offering. And uh, we will go... We will go ahead with the offering. First, Tim First Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 says the following. Let the elders who perform the duties of the office well, be considered doubly worthy of honor and of adequate financial support, especially those who labor faithfully in preaching and teaching. And now here's the principle. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out the grain. And again, the laborer is worthy of his hire. Okay. So, God put that in the law. We can go to 1 Corinthians 9. But God put that in the law because He cares for the ox. So, but there's, there's a, a revelation behind it also. So Paul quotes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 also. I'm going to start reading here at verse 7. Consider this. What soldier at any time serves at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat any of the fruit of it? Who tends a flock and does not partake of the milk of the flock? Do I say this only on a human authority and as a man reasons? Does not the law endorse the same principle? For in the law of Moses it is written, You shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out the corn. Is it only for oxen that God cares? Or does he speak certainly and entirely for our sakes? Assuredly it is written for our sakes. Because the plowman ought to plow in hope, and the thresher ought to thresh in expectation of partaking of the harvest. If we have sown the seed of spiritual good among you, is it too much if we reap from your material benefits? 
if others share in this rightful claim upon you, do, do not we have, still have a better and greater claim? However, we never exercise this right, but we endure everything rather than put a hindrance in the way of the good news. So he said that because of offense. People got offended because, and it's a, it's a lot like that um, in, in the hearts of many people. People get offended when preachers prosper. Now he says, do you not know that those men who are employed in the services of the temple get their food from the temple? And that those who tend the altar share with the altar in the offerings brought. On the same principle, the Lord directed. So this is even greater than the law of Moses. This is now Jesus directing. That those who publish the gospel, the good news, should live and get their maintenance by, by the gospel. And then he says, I have not made use of these privileges, nor am I writing um, to suggest that any provision be made for me now because of offense. So let's just pick it up in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Just listen to this. Verse 13 says, 2 Corinthians 12, for in what respect were you put, in, uh, put to a disadvantage in comparison with the rest of the churches? Unless it was for the fact that I myself did not burden you with my financial support. Pardon me for doing you this injust injustice. So he, he said, the first time I wrote to you, well, the, the, in the previous letter, he said, I said, I, I don't want provision for that to be made now, Okay. Because I don't want a hindrance for the gospel. But he says, I have put you in a disadvantage in comparison with the rest of the churches. So all the other churches did give him financial support. But he didn't want from that church because of offense. Now he said, pardon me for doing you the injustice of not letting you contribute. So, um, so we're not going to do you the injustice. <laughs> But I just want to um, take you back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If we have sown the seed of spiritual good among you, is it too much if we reap from your material benefits? Okay, so I'm going to put the details on the screen um, for, for the offering right now. Uh, but I, I, have, I have a request. Um, if you feel in your heart you want to contribute to Johan van Rensburg, then you can contribute, but just put the reference... Johan, Johan van Rensburg, or JVR, or Johan, or whatever you want to say, but make it, make it clear, make the reference Johan, so that when I see it on the statement, I can take the money and pay it over to him. So if you feel, because he has sown the seed of spiritual good just now, okay, he's there in Johannesburg, and he's got his expenses, and we're here in Pretoria, so um, I, just, I just want to ask you to, uh, if you feel it on your heart to also think of him and contribute. All right, so. Did you open it? Can I get any key drug? Can I get any key drug? Okay, just hold on. <laughs> okay, there we go. So you'll see the details on the screen there. There's a snap scan. Um, QR code, that's what it's called. <laughs> and the banking details of the church, and then my personal banking details is there for me and my family. And um, obviously the Visa and MasterCard facilities, I have it here, but you can't reach it. So, <laughs> so the internet banking transfer is the way to go. Also, if you're outside of South Africa, I think the best way is to use PayPal. Uh, so if you, uh, if you uh, contribute today, um, be blessed, receive a harvest on your blessing. Um, we receive the open hand of God's provision through you. We receive the blessing God has for us as preachers, as ministers, through your hand. God is using you to also provide for us. Okay? So, um, and we are blessed and we are so thankful. I, I put a video on, on the faithfulness of God. And I was just so blessed. Um, just before... The, um, we went live here, Johan sang a song, and you'll be able to find it on his page later, about the faithfulness of God. And I, I did a video on the faithfulness of God, and I, I spoke a little bit on, um, you know, God who is 
he's, who has promised is faithful to do it. He watches over his word to perform it. But that morning, the song that your aunt, your aunt sang just before we went live um, it was so in my heart. That very song that he wrote years ago. <laughs> so it's just about the faithfulness of, of Jesus. God is faithful to provide you every need. So um, he's faithful to provide for us. Okay. So um, he's also faithful to provide for you. So as you give, understand that God is faithful and that he will provide your every need. Uh, may you be blessed in your giving today, in Jesus' name. Remember, if you want to give to your own, um, I don't have his banking details on the screen now, but if you, you can use our banking details and just in the reference say it's for your own. All right. So, we'll just give a minute or two and uh, we go on with the message just now. Right. Be blessed. We call a harvest on all your seed. In Jesus' name, we pray for the supernatural reign of God to reign on your seed. We pray for a multiplication back to you for everything that you've sown. And I call this seed um, as representing all the seeds that you've ever sown. And we call a harvest on all those seeds. In Jesus' name, we pray, Lord Jesus, for breakthrough in finances we pray lord jesus for multiplication of finances in this time in jesus name amen okay so um i want to start reading in john chapter 6 today so um we're gonna we're gonna read a lot but we'll we'll see how far we go and uh but i i just have a word on my heart so, Jesus just fed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch, okay? And uh, then he went across the water, uh, and uh, so they found him also on the other side, okay? Now, let's start in verse 25, of John chapter 6. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Rabbi... When did you come here? Jesus answered, I assure you most solemnly I tell you, you have been searching for me not because you saw the miracles and signs, but because you were fed with the loaves and were filled and satisfied. All right. I want to switch. Can you talk for on a Bible, bro? I want to switch Bibles because this one's got bigger letters. <laughs> That's my beautiful wife. Come say hello. <laughs> she says no. <laughs> but she says hi. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. I've looked for this Bible for quite a while now. It's got, you know, and it's just some nice other notes that I made years ago. So it's just, it's great. Okay, John chapter 6. Jesus said, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, I, you've been searching for me not because you saw the miracles and signs, but because you were fed with the loaves and were filled and satisfied. So there was a natural hunger and there was a natural satisfaction. Okay. Now he says, so I mean, that's, that's basically also speaking about the law. I mean, the manna is natural bread. That satisfy them in a natural way. And the, the word of the law is a word um, that speaks about natural things. What you shall do and what you shall not do. It speaks of works of the flesh. Okay, so now verse 27 says, Stop toiling and doing and producing for the food that perishes and decomposes in the using. 
but strive and work and produce rather for the lasting food which endures continually unto life eternal. The Son of Man will give, furnish you that for God the Father has authorized and certified him and put his seal of endorsement upon him. Okay, so Jesus says, stop. Stop working. Stop striving for the word that does not satisfy. Isaiah 55. But he says, stop working um, for the food that perishes. Okay, now perish is also to die. Okay, stop working for food. Stop working for food that perishes in the using. Okay. But strive rather for food that lasts unto life eternal. So start working. <laughs> or strive. Strive for this food. That endures unto life eternal. Okay. So, there is an effort and a, and a toiling that people see as, as good. That people see as uh, working towards righteousness. But the end of it is death. The end of it is perishing. It's food that doesn't last. It's food that... That for a moment makes you feel a little bit better, but then it's, it's just gone again. So the works of the law is much like that. So uh, you, have to, you have to keep on sustaining yourself by your own works. Okay, It's not something that lasts. Um, so the, even in Second Corinthians 3, the glory that was revealed in the face of Moses was a fading glory that passed away. It was there for a while, but it faded away and it passed away. All right, now, now it says, uh, now they ask him this question, what are we to do that we may habitually be working the works of God? What are we to do to carry out what God requires? Jesus replied, so he says, stop working, and he says, start working. Now he says, so this work that you say, that's going to strive unto life eternal. What is it? What do we have to, what does God require from us that we may be working the works of God? Jesus replied, verse 29, this is the work that God asks of you, that you believe in the one whom he has sent. Okay, so what is this work? That you believe. Okay, so this is a central theme today so uh, you can you can just check out also in John chapter 3 verse 16 says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes on him might not perish but have eternal everlasting life okay so we're going to read a lot out of John chapter 6 and John chapter 8 today so but you know just just walk with me through it okay therefore they said to him what sign will you perform then so that we may see it and believe and rely and adhere to you. What supernatural work have you to show what you can do? He just fed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch. Okay. <laughs> and he just called them out on it and said, you're just here because you're hungry. You want more food. You, you don't understand. You didn't even see the miracle. Okay. So now they ask for another sign. Our forefathers ate the manna in the wilderness as the scripture says he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. So Jesus said to them, I assure you most solemnly I tell you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. What Moses gave you was not the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true heavenly bread. For the bread of God is he who comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Okay, so now there is... Uh, there's a parallel here. Okay, so Moses had a word 
is a man sent from God. He had a certain word, okay? Um, and they, he had a certain bread to give them. So he came and he spoke a certain word. And he came and he gave them natural bread to eat, okay? So, but then on the other side, um, there's Jesus Christ. He says, he came, he is the word that was sent from God, that lasts unto life eternal. He is the fulfillment of everything that, that Moses wrote. And he gives bread from heaven, but that bread from heaven, which Moses was the parable of, is himself, his body. And those, those, his body he gives to us in the, in the form of the gospel, in the form of the communion. Okay, so, so it's, it's a parallel in the spiritual and in the physical. The communion, we'll speak about it a little bit later on. The communion is a, f- a physical demonstration of what we believe to be true. It's a, it's a prophetic or a, or a, a faith action that we believe the words of Jesus Christ dying on the cross, being sacrificed for us, or being raised from the dead and ascending to heaven, those words bring life to us. So as we eat the bread and it becomes one with us, we eat the word of life, it becomes one with us and it gives us life, eternal life. Okay, so they ate manna, but that manna didn't give them the life. They heard the words of Moses, but the words of Moses didn't give them life. Um, just the previous chapter, and I've said that over and over, John 5, 39, Jesus said, you search the scriptures and you suppose that you have life through them, but the scriptures testify about me, and you would not come to me that you might have life. So the life is in the person, Jesus, and the life is not in the actions that people do outwardly in response to scriptures. If people don't see the scriptures finds its fulfillment in Jesus, and Jesus is the bread. Jesus is the one that everyone's, everything speaks of. The bread is a person, not information. Okay, we, we'll go on. Okay, our forefathers ate manna in the wilderness. It says, Moses, what Moses gave you was not the bread from heaven. My father gives the true heavenly bread, and it is him who comes down from heaven to give life to the world. Verse 34. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. So remember in the beginning of the book of John, he says, in the beginning was the word, brackets in Amplified Christ, and the word was God and the word was with God. So the word was sent, Psalm 107 verse 20, he sends his word to heal them, to bring life to them. Okay, so the word was sent. Okay, Isaiah 55, as the heavens, as the rain comes down from heaven, the snow, and return not there, but produces an effect, so shall my words be. It shall not return to me void without having an effect. So the word was sent like rain. The word was sent like water. But the word that was sent, the person, the spirit, word of God, is him. It says in John, uh, John chapter 1, the word became flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glorious of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he came to show the glory of the Father. He came to show forth God. Verse 18 in John chapter 1 says, He says, No one has seen the Father, but the Son has come to show him, to reveal him, to declare him, to make him known. Okay, so he's the bread of heaven because he came to manifest the unseen into the seen. He came to speak words that bring life. He came to give up his flesh containing this word inside him as a meal for us, as a a means of receiving life into into our system, into our spirit, soul, and body. All right, so uh, the person is the bread, the person Jesus Christ. All right, then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread. Jesus said, I am the bread. I'm just trying to find my place again. And he says, he who comes to me will never be hungry. He who believes in me will never thirst anymore. Okay. Now, I want you to, to, to note this. He says, he who comes to me. He who comes to me will never be hungry. Ah. Oh. 
He who comes to me will never be hungry. With other words, he who comes to me will never be without the bread of life, giving life. Okay? Okay, he who comes to me will not be hungry. So we'll be looking at the coming um, to Christ, the coming to, to him. Okay? Uh, we'll, we'll, I'm just saying that. We'll touch on it when we get to John chapter 8. All right. He who relies on me will never thirst anymore. But as I told you, although you have seen me, you still you do not believe and trust and have faith. Okay. So they are not satisfied with what they see. They are not satisfied with what they hear. They do not want to come to him. John 5.39, he says, you search the scriptures, but you are unwilling to come to me that you might have life. Uh, remember in where is it Matthew 11 Jesus says uh, everyone who is uh, tired and heavy laden let him come to me and I will give him rest okay come to me all right so he who comes to me is never hungry never thirsts anymore okay so he says Although you have seen me, still you do not believe and trust in faith. So still you do not want to. You saw the miracles. You saw the multiplying of the bread. You heard everything I said, but you don't want to come. It is hard for you to hear what I'm saying. It is difficult for you to believe what I'm saying. Okay. Verse 37. Now listen to this. All whom my Father gives to me will come to me. All who my Father, the Father gives to Jesus, will come. So if you don't come, you're not going to be with Him. If you are given to Jesus by the Father, you will come to Jesus. All right. And I, and I most certainly will not cast out, I will never, no, never reject one of them who comes to me. Okay, so like Ephesians says, you are accepted in the beloved. He accepts all those who come to you. Okay, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will and purpose, but to do the will and purpose of him who sent me. So this is all about what the father said and what the father wants him to do. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should not lose any of all that he has given me, but that I should give new life and raise them all up at the last day. I'm not going to now speak about the last day, all that. I'm not going to focus on that now. It's going to, it's, that's a sermon on its own. It says, he who comes to me will never thirst. All those whom the Father gives to me comes to me. So if you come to him, you are one of those. He says, all whom my father gives to me will come to me. The one who comes to me, I will not reject. Will not reject one of, uh, yeah, never, never reject one of them who comes to me. Okay. All right. For this is my Father's will, His purpose. Everyone who sees the Son and believes in and cleaves to trust, relies on Him, should have eternal life. And I will raise Him up from the dead at the last day. So here He's standing right in front of Him, of, of these people. And He's saying words to them. And even standing right in front of them in the flesh, they are unable to come to him. They are unable to receive the words that he is speaking to them. They do not understand you. They think everything is about, they, they make spiritual things fleshly. And they want to make fleshly things spiritual. Okay. Right, so he's standing right there. God wants, the Father wants to give them eternal life. They need to actually hear what the Father is saying and believe so that they can come to Jesus. All right. Now the Jews murmured and found fault 
with and grumbled about Jesus because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Okay. He didn't even say, I'm giving you new bread and leave it there. He said, I'm giving you new bread, but the bread that, that, and that the, fa the Father actually gives the bread, the bread is me. You must eat me. They kept asking, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Making it carnal again. They can't recognize the gift that's right in front of them. How then can he say, I have come down from heaven? So Jesus answered them, stop grumbling and saying things against me to one another. No one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me attracts and draws him and gives him the desire to come to me. And then I will raise him up from the dead at the last day. Okay, so God the Father will give a desire for people to come to Jesus. So if you have a desire, guess what? You are, you, you are the one that needs to come to Jesus. Okay, God will give you a, a desire. He will draw you with His goodness. And He will raise Him up from the dead at the last day. Okay, now this is important. Verse 45. It is written in the book of the prophets, And they shall all be taught of God, have him in the person for their teacher. Everyone who has listened to and learned from the Father comes to me. If you listen to the Father, if you hear what the Father is saying, you come to Jesus. And Jesus is the bread of life. And you will be raised. You will, be, you will receive. You believe in Him. Okay. There's doctrines going around, and I grew up with this stuff, that there's certain people who are called, and other people who are not called. And there's certain people who are chosen, and other people who are not chosen. So for those who are chosen, doesn't matter if what they do, God will bend their will until they serve Him and they will be saved. And those who are, um, who are not chosen, doesn't matter what they do and how much they want to come to God, sorry, you can't come. Okay? That doctrine is out of the pit of hell and it's a lie. Because it causes people not to preach the word. And it causes people not to bring the word to unsaved people groups. Okay? Because why, why should you? Because if they call, they will come. If God has chosen them, they will come. No. It doesn't say, how does God draw people? He who comes never is hungry. The Father gives everyone who comes to me. All those who listen to the Father and hear what the Father says comes to me. Jesus said, I am not here speaking my own word. I only say what the Father says. So that means everything that Jesus said is everything that the Father said. So everyone that heard His words, everyone that understood that He is the Word made flesh, the Spirit dwelling in human flesh, speaking only what the Father is speaking. So when He speaks, it's the Father speaking. And when you hear and listen to the Father, what you are hearing is the, is the words of Jesus speaking to you, and you have a desire to come. And when you come, He will never reject you. So it's about the Word being preached by the Spirit of God. And when the word is preached by the Spirit of God, when people hear it and the anointing is on the word, the people's hearts are touched. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 4 says in the Amplified, stirring in the minds of my ears, most holy emotions, and thus persuading them. So the, the word touches them and they start to experience something of the Spirit of God. And when they start to experience something of the Spirit of God, they are convinced of the truth of it. And they want to know this person. And they are drawn to him and they start coming. All those who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. 
And it's the same thing that he says in Hebrews chapter 4. He says, come and enter the rest. The promise still remains for some to enter the rest. But they will not come. And he said in his wrath, he swore that everyone who does not believe shall never enter his rest. Which means that there, there is a rest available for those who do believe in him. So those who do believe do enter the rest. And the, if you read the rest of Hebrews chapter 4, it speaks of coming to the throne of grace. We can call, all come boldly to the throne of grace to receive the, the power of God, the mercy of God when we need it. Well-timed help coming just when we need it. So if you enter the rest and you come to a throne, you will sit on that throne. Seated with Christ in heavenly places. You come to where the Father is. So uh, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father on the throne. And we are seated with him. We come to him. To a place of rest. To a place of authority. To a place of power. To a place of eternal everlasting life. When we hear the words of the Father and believe. And come to him. We need to come to Jesus. All right. Every day you need to come to him. Every night you need to come to him. <laughs> when you got saved, you needed to come to him, but still every day you need to come to him. Oh, and people now say, oh, how can I come to Jesus if I'm already with him? He says, come, so come. Okay. <laughs> Coming to Jesus simply means this. You open your heart and you let his words find entrance into your heart coming to him just means you draw near to god and he draw near to you, draws near to you it's a place of intimacy it's a place of being on on purpose intimate with god on purpose drawing near to him and not just sitting around waiting till something happens but you need to come into the rest come to him who is the bread of life have fellowship with those words of life and partake and eat of the bread of life that gives life to the world. All right. Verse 46. Which does not imply that anyone has seen the Father, not that anyone has ever seen him. Okay, so they, they only saw the Father when they saw Jesus. Jesus came to declare the Father. John 14, he says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. So no one without looking at Jesus has seen the Father. Before him, no one saw him. But they can recognize his voice by Jesus speaking the voice of the Father. Okay, so he came unto his own, John 1, but his own received him not. But to as many as did receive him, gave he power to become sons of God, as many as believed on his name. Who owe their birth neither to blood, so the will of the flesh, uh, but to God. They are born from above or born from God. All right, so now he says, verse 47, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, he who believes in me has now possesses eternal life. So we need to constantly feed on the word of life. We need to constantly hear those words. Meditate on those words and speak on those words. Uh, Proverbs 18 verse 20 also says, A man shall be filled with the, with the words of his mouth. His belly shall be filled with the words of his mouth. So imagine we start speaking the words of life. Imagine we start speaking the words um, of eternal life, the bread of life to people. How satisfied will we be? Okay, Never hungry, never thirsty, because we came to him. We partook of the words. We filled our mouth with his words. We filled our mind with his word. We, we filled everything. And now we start speaking the words of God. And our belly is filled and satisfied with the words of life. Verse 48. I am the bread of life that gives life. The life, uh, the, the living bread. Your forefathers ate the manna in the wilderness and yet they died. So people before us, they tried their best to live a life uh, which is good and acceptable according to the law, and yet they died. Okay, so uh, it, it doesn't say that they had bad, uh, they meant anything bad, bad motives, not at all. But God is revealing something of the life of Christ 
uh, that comes through His Word to us now. And we need to eat this bread. We need to partake of this Word. We need to have fellowship with the Spirit. We need to, we need to embrace this Word and let these words find entrance into our heart. Okay. But this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and never die. I'm going to read this again. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and never die. It didn't say so that some who are chosen may eat. No, it says that anyone may eat of it and never die. All right, so he says, verse 51, I myself am this living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. So if we feast on him, if we take our nourishment from him, the person, we will live forever. And also the bread that I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh body. Okay, so he gave up his flesh body as a sacrifice for the life of the world. Okay, so that the whole world, everyone who believes in him might not perish but have eternal everlasting life. So the word speaking of his flesh body being sacrificed on the cross is the bread of life. And the parallel to that is we partake of the communion. Okay. Then the Jews angrily contended with one another, saying, How is he able to give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, you cannot have any life in you unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, unless you appropriate his life and the saving merit of his blood. Okay, so this means the following. So in some way, you need to intentionally eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ. It needs to be your intent that you eat his flesh and you drink his blood. Otherwise, this scripture will have no benefit for you. And the only place where Jesus gave us that kind of uh, device to, uh, to eat his flesh and drink his blood is when he took bread and he broke it. And he said, take it, this is my body. Because he said and declared, take it, this is my body broken for you. Uh, eat this in remembrance of me. From that moment that he said it, it became his body. Because he said it. Take it, this is my body broken for you. So now with intent, by faith, you can eat his body and the same manner with the cup, he said, this is a cup of the New Testament in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. Okay. So with intent, you remember his blood poured out. With intent, you remember his body broken. That is the word of life. You meditate on it so it's in your mind. So in your mind, you have the word of life. You eat it. So you touch, feel, see it. It's... it's uh, it's a word that, that brings life to you in all dimensions. Okay, so you intentionally eat his flesh, intentionally drink his blood, not as a ritual, not as a symbol, but by faith as the real fact. So he's, he didn't say, this is another ritual that I wanted to give to the church to keep you busy and partake of the communion. He didn't say that. He said, he declared. So if you had, uh, you know, substitution in primary school mathematics, you will understand this. So A plus 1 is 2. What is A? Oh, A is 1 because 1 plus 1 is 2. Substitution. Okay. He said, I, he took bread. Everyone knows it's bread. Normal bread. And he broke it. And then he declared, this is now my body. So, now because of that declaration, his, that bread became his body. He took wine, normal wine, and he declared, this is my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. And the point is not to reason about whether it is his body or not. The point is about meditating on the cross. The point is about coming to him at the cross, having fellowship 
with his flesh being broken in, in parts for us. His flesh body being uh, opened up so that we can enter in. Okay, it's about having fellowship with him on the cross the moment that time he was crucified on the cross. And we, the only way we can have fellowship with him in that time is through eating and drinking his flesh and his blood. Okay, that is where the life came into the world, the cross of Christ. So the word bring that fellowship to us. And the communion is an action, faith action that we take in which we, uh, we have intimate fellowship with his suffering, with his body broken and his blood poured out. So that our soul, our spirit, our body may receive life. All right. So the manna maybe was a prefigure of the, of the bread of life that was to come. Not maybe, it was. A prefigure of it was something prophesying the fulfillment of it, but the communion is the real fact of it. Okay, okay, so I myself am this living bread that came down from heaven, and if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And also, the bread that I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh body. Then the Jews angrily contended. So, people usually. Uh, who look at things only as a symbol get very angry uh, the same way they did when we speak about these things verse 53 and jesus said to them i assure you most solemnly i tell you you cannot have any life in you unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood it angers people when they hear this verse 54 he who feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up from the dead on the last day. Okay. So, receiving the word and eating his flesh and drinking his blood, all points on coming to Jesus. Verse 55. For my flesh is true and genuine food, and my blood is true and genuine drink. He who feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood dwells continually in me, and I in like manner dwell continually in him. That is amazing. So I want to feed on his flesh and drink on his blood because I want to dwell in him, and I want him to dwell in me. But also, he says in John chapter 15, he says, abide in me and I in you. And he's speaking of the word. Okay, so there's a parallel between the communion taken and the word heard and believed. Verse 57. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live by and through because of the Father, even so, whoever continues to feed on me, whoever takes me for his food and his nourishment, and is nourished by me, shall in his turn live through and because of me. Okay. Imagine you can eat something that makes you alive, really alive. Well, God gave it. It's Him, <laughs> Himself. Feeding on His Word, feeding on the Gospel, and feeding on the bread that He declared to be His body, and the wine that He declared to be His blood. Verse 58, This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the manna which our forefathers ate and yet died. He who takes this bread for his food shall live forever. He said these things in a synagogue while he was teaching at Capernaum. When his disciples heard this, many of them said, This is a hard, difficult, strange saying, an offensive, unbearable message. Who can stand to hear it? Who can be expected to listen to such teaching? So if that is your reaction to what I'm saying, the Bible says that was the reaction of the disciples. Okay, so who can bear to hear it? Who can listen to, who can stand such teaching? This is a strange and hard saying. 
this is too much, we can't take this. Okay, that's exactly what the disciples said to Jesus. Verse 61, but Jesus, knowing within himself that his disciples were complaining and protesting and grumbling about it, said to them, Is this a stumbling block and an offense to you? Does this upset and displease and shock and scandalize you? What then will be your reaction if you should see the Son of Man ascending to the place where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. He is the life giver. The flesh conveys no benefit whatsoever, whatever. There is no profit in it. The words that I have been speaking to you are spirit and life. So what words have we been speaking to you? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. What words has he, has he been speaking? He says, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Okay? Those words are spirit and those words are life. But still some of you fail to believe and trust and have faith. For Jesus knew from the first who did not believe and had no faith and who would betray him and be false to him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him, unless he is enabled to do so by the Father. How is he enabled to do so by the Father? If he listens to the Father and listens to the word of the Father. So if you can bear hearing the strange teaching. If you can bear listening to the offensive words of Jesus, <laughs> you can come to him. You will receive something in your life, a drawing that draws you to the Father, that draws you to Jesus. But if we uh, rather exalt our traditions, our theology and our dogma above the hard, strange teaching of Jesus, uh, then we will resist coming to him but we will pour over the scriptures diligently thinking that we will have life in them but missing the fact that the scriptures testify about jesus not coming to him verse 64 but still some of you fail to believe and trust in their faith okay verse 65 he said this this is why i told you we read that verse 66 after this many of his disciples drew back returned to their old associations and no longer accompanied him okay so uh like in today's terms you know they unfriended him <laughs> on facebook <laughs> verse 67 jesus said to the 12 will you also go away he didn't say come back come back he said do you also want to go okay are you also offended at what i just said okay simon peter answered Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words, the message of eternal life. And we have learned to believe and trust. And more, we have come to know surely that you are the Holy One of God, the Christ, the Anointed One, the Son of the Living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He was speaking of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he was about to betray him, although he was one of the twelve. All right. Let's just go over to John chapter 8. Now, in John chapter 8, there was a woman caught in the act of adultery, and they threw her at the feet of Jesus, and they said that Moses says that such a woman offender should be stoned, so the food that perishes okay kill this woman and jesus said he just stooped down he wrote on the ground he said okay one without sin cast the first stone and they all conscience stricken went away and jesus did not accuse her he spoke a different word to her he said where are your accusers she said no one here lord and he said neither do i condemn you now here comes the word go and sin no more a word that set her free a word that empowered her to live a holy life the word came poof, empowered her she received life from the person who is the life-giving spirit of god speaking to her and she was set free in a moment all right so john chapter 8 then after this whole thing with a woman he says 
We will not get anywhere. We will not receive life. It leads to death. But if we feast on the words of Jesus, the words of life, the words of his body broken, his blood poured out for you, for, for us. Um, if we feast on that, we receive the true heavenly bread. And we receive eternal, everlasting life. All right. Let's start at reading at verse 30. As he said these things, many believed in him. Uh, let's start at verse 28. I think it's good. So, uh, Jesus said to him, When you have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, you will realize and know that I am he for whom you look for. And that I do nothing of myself of my own accord or of my own authority. But I say exactly what my Father has taught me. So if you hear Jesus speaking, you're hearing the Father speaking. Verse 29. And he who sent me is ever with me. My Father has not left me alone for I always do what pleases him. As he said these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to those Jews who had believed in him. If you abide in my word, hold fast to my teachings and live in accordance with them, you are truly my disciples. Okay, he said the same thing in John chapter 15. If, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Verse 32. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you, you free. So what is this truth? The truth is him. It's the word speaking. And that word speaking of his body broken. And his blood poured out. The word speaking of the cross. Verse 33. They answered him. We are Abraham's offspring. And have never been in bondage to anybody. What do you mean by saying you will be set free? Jesus answered them. But just think of that. They've been in bondage to everyone. They've been bondage to the Romans. They've been in, in Babylonian captivity. I mean, every now and then someone came and put them under siege. Uh, under siege. They, were, they have been in bondage in their history since, since Abraham. Okay, so uh, Jesus answered them, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, whoever commits and practices sin is a slave of sin. Now a slave does not remain in a household permanently. The son of the house does remain forever. So if the son liberates you, the one who is abiding forever, if the son liberates you and makes you free men, then you are really and unquestionably free. Yes, I know that you are Abraham's offspring. Yet you plan to kill me. He's speaking to the Jews that believed on him. Yet you plan to kill me because my word has no entrance, makes no progress, does not find any place in you. All right. So the word must find in Why do you strive for the food that perishes? Rather strive for this food. Okay. What are we to do that you believe in the one, the person that he has sent, the word that became flesh? Okay. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread. Eat me. <laughs> Who can bear to hear this? Okay, so they cannot hear it. These words cannot find entrance into their hearts. Okay? And because of the fact that the words of life cannot find entrance into the heart, guess what? The word that ends in de death and perishing is in the heart. And what's the result? They plan to bring death and they plan to kill Jesus. All right. My word has no entrance in you. Verse 38. I tell the things which I have seen and learned at my father's side. And your actions also reflect what you have heard and learned from your father. 
They retorted, Abraham is our father. Jesus said, if you were truly Abraham's children, then you would not do the works of, uh, then, then you would do the works of Abraham, follow his example, do as Abraham did. But now instead you are wanting and seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I have heard from God. This is not the way Abraham acted. You are doing the works of your own father, they said to him. We are not illegitimate children and born out of fornication. We have one father, even God. I thought Abraham was your father. Verse 42. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me and respect me and welcome me gladly. For I proceeded and came forth from God out of his very presence. I did not even come on my own authority or of my own accord as self-appointed, but he sent me. Why do you misunderstand what I say? So here's the reason why a lot of people misunderstand what Jesus says. Why do you misunderstand what I say? It is because you are unable to hear what I'm saying. You cannot bear to listen to my message. Your ears are shut to my teaching. Okay. People relying on stuff that they were taught that is not the true word of God. And exalting their degree, exalting their doctrine, exalting their dogma, exalting their tradition above the word of God. Exalting their own ideas and their own agendas and their own pride above what Jesus is actually saying. Do you know how offended people get when you actually just believe what the word says? Okay. Uh, and that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says. The natural, non-spiritual man does not admit into his heart the gifts and teachings and revelations of the Holy Spirit, for it is folly, meaningless nonsense to him. But the spiritual man knows all things, tries all things, and yet is put on trial by no man, because who has known the mind of the Lord to instruct him and give him knowledge? But we have the mind of the Lord. We have the mind of Christ. And we do hold the thoughts and purposes of his heart. How can we hold the thoughts and purposes of God? How can we have the mind of Christ? If we believe in the one whom God has sent. If we are prepared to listen to the Father. If we are prepared to hear what he is saying. And come to him and not our own idea of what it's supposed to look like, but come to the person, Jesus Christ. We will never be hungry. We will find rest. Come to Jesus who is the bread of life. This, the fact that Jesus is the, the bread of life, makes it that people are unable, they, they just can't take it because they can't stand on their own works and their own merits. It makes no sense to them. They they, they want, don't want it. Romans chapter 8 also says, the mind of the flesh um, is in enmity to God and it cannot submit to God's law. Okay, so that's the mind of the flesh. It's always fighting against God. It's always resisting God. It's always uh, shoving God back. God is welcoming us, calling us, but we are reasoning contrary to the truth, betraying ourselves into deception. No, no, no. I want it my way. God says, just come, just come. Receive the bread of life. People say, no, this is this, this, this. God says, come. People want their own way. People want their own thoughts. If you say what God sent you to say, then there's no problem. But the thing is, you, you want to preach what, what, what you want to say, what you learned somewhere, and you want to feel significant through trying to know something that someone else doesn't. Rather just say what God is saying. If, if you say what God is saying, then this, you are out of the question. You are out of the way. You don't take it personally when someone disagrees with you because it's not your own message. Okay? So people don't want to hear this because it's not an intellectual thing. It doesn't make sense. How can you say Jesus gave us his flesh and, and blood to eat? Oh, it's only the Catholics that believe that, um, that the, the communion is his blood. and his, uh, we, Everyone knows it's a, it's a bread. It's a, it's a juice or wine. Yeah, but by faith. By faith. Jesus said, this is my, my body broken for you. Is it so hard to believe that? If Jesus declared a bread his body, I, I believe it. I eat it as his body. By faith. 
If Jesus declared the wine is blood, I drink it as his blood by faith. Why is this so difficult? Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Yeah, but nothing. This is what it says. And we just need to be obedient to it. If you want eternal life, you need to read it and believe it. And stop reasoning contrary to the truth and reason yourself out of the blessing. Okay? All right. So, uh, if you feel I'm, I'm uh, angry with you, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not angry with you. I'm speaking basically to, towards these mindsets and these ideas. Okay. Not you personally there watching. I can see you there through the lens. Yeah, you're drinking your coffee right now. Take another sip. Bless you. <laughs> All right. Now, let's just continue here. Why do you misunderstand? It's because you're unable to hear. Verse 44. You are of your father the devil. And it is your will to practice the lusts and gratify the desires which are characteristic of your father. So Jesus speaks to these guys who want to kill him. Jesus speaks to these guys who doesn't want to hear his word. And he says, you learn from your father, I learn from my father. You, you learn from his nature, I learn from the nature of my father. You practice the lust of your father, I practice the desire of my father. You are of your father the devil, I am of my father God. Okay? So that's pretty s straightforward. And he, he doesn't hold the punches. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a falsehood, he speaks what is natural to him for he is a liar and the father of lies and all that is false. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me, you do not trust me, rely on me and adhere to me. Why is it so difficult for people to recognize truth? It's because they are focused on themselves. And uh, they, they can't trust anyone else that what that person is saying is really the truth. Verse 46. Who of you convicts me of wrongdoing or finds me guilty of sin? Then if I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? Okay. So, also in uh, John chapter 10 and in John chapter 14, Jesus said, listen, you don't believe what I say, but believe the works that I do. If you don't believe the, miracle, the, the words that I say, at least believe the works that testify. It's the Father's testimony that I'm speaking the truth. Okay. So verse 47. Who, whoever is of God listens to God. So simple. So we need to get our pride out of the way. And we need to let His word find entrance into our heart. And we need to listen to God. Your idea isn't a great idea. The Father's idea is the great idea. Okay? So we need to have our minds renewed by reading the Word, hearing the Word, and if the Word is different from what we think, we need to think differently. We need to allow the Word to enter our minds and our hearts and to bring renewal so that we can have eternal life. We need to listen to God. Those who belong to God hear the words of God. It's so important to hear what God is saying. I'm not just saying... Now, 24-7, 24, 24, listen to sermons, but it will benefit you. But 24-7, uh, listening to sermons, that's not what I'm saying. Is Are you hearing what God is saying? Are you agreeing with the words that the Spirit is speaking? Are you listening for His voice? Are you hungry to hear from God? Or are you just there to, to try and prove your own doctrine? Okay. This is the reason that you do not listen to those words to me. Because you do not belong to God and are not of God and in harmony with Him. So a lot of people are already so hard-hearted and stiff-necked and resistant to God that when they hear the truth, they can't recognize it. Okay, So let's just have a humble attitude and turn to the Word and find the Spirit of God. Find the person of God. If you are willing to come to the person, you will find life. If you are looking for the person on every page, you will find him. But if you are looking to, for, for yourself on every page, you will not find Jesus. If you are looking for how you messed it and how you messed up and what you must do to get, be better, and you will not find Jesus. But if you look for the cross and you look for Jesus, you will find him from Genesis to Re Revelation and he will reveal himself to you. Okay, So this is either... 
a stumbling stone or this is a, a rock of refuge, this book. So either you will find the person or you will be blinded to see the person. Depends on what your attitude of heart is. Are you open to hear from God? Uh, are you open to hear His words and receive it into your heart? And that will mean change. Or do you just want to put it on and do your own thing? Okay, so that's basically what he's saying. So verse 48, the Jews answered, are we not right when we say that you're a Samaritan and you have a demon? Yeah. That you are under the power of an evil spirit. Jesus answered, I'm not possessed by a demon. On the contrary, I honor and reverence my father and you dishonor me. However, I'm not in search of honor for myself. I do not seek and I'm not aiming for my own glory. There is one who looks after that. He seeks my glory and he is the judge. So <laughs> that's nice. But don't worry, the Father will honor me. I don't need your honor. Verse 51. I assure you most solemnly I tell you. If anyone observes my teaching. You get it? Lives in accordance with my message. Keeps my word. He will by no means ever see and experience death. Yo. This means if we hear what the Father is saying and He gives us to Jesus and we come to Him and we hear what Jesus is saying, we hear, we obey, we obey, we keep His word, you will not die. But you will have eternal life. You will by no means experience death. See and experience death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you are under the power of a demon. Do you see how this word of life can offend people? <laughs> Especially natural people. Now we know that you are insane. So, so there might even be people now thinking, Oh, this guy is insane. He's out of his mind. Great. Well, I'm not, I'm not out of my mind. I'm out of your mind, like David Hogan says. <laughs> but I, I actually just want to be in the mind of Christ and not even be in my mind. All right. Abraham died and also the prophets. Yet you say, I am, uh, if a man keeps my word, he will never taste of death into all eternity. Are you greater than our father Abraham? Well, yes, <laughs> Jesus is greater than the father Abraham. He died and all the prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? So, I mean, how arrogant can you get? <laughs> Who speaks to Jesus like that? I mean, verse 54, Jesus answered, If I were to glorify myself, magnify, praise and honor myself, I would have no real glory, for my glory would be nothing and worthless. My honor must come to me from my Father. It is my Father who glorifies me and extols and magnifies praises me, of whom you say he is your God. Yet you do not know him or recognize him. Came unto his own, with his own received him not. Okay, did not recognize him. And are not acquainted with him. But I know him. If I should say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I know him and keep his word. Okay, so Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. The world sees it as foolishness. To save them that believe. Okay, it, it, it's, the verse before that is, when the world by its philosophy and by its knowledge did not recognize God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So, when people don't recognize God, this is by your focus on yourself reading the law and the prophets, by your focus on yourself reading the scriptures, by you trying, you're not going to recognize Him. The way you're going to recognize Him is by listening to Him and coming to Him. Listening to His words and coming to Him. Listening to His words and coming to Him. In a personal relationship with Him. Listening to his words, coming to him. Okay? So, that means, by the foolishness of preaching, to save them that believe. You hear the word, and you believe it, and you are saved. 
All right. He says, you don't know him, but I know him. So everyone who, who hates God, everyone who wants to kill everyone, everyone who is so aggressive and with the same attitude as these Pharisees, they just don't know God. And that's also what First John chapter 4 says, is if anyone does not love, they do not know God uh, because God is love. So we can preach to them, we can speak the word, we can heal the sick and preach the gospel and go all over and do what God says, but they refuse to recognize the miracles. They will not recognize, they will not believe that it is miracles. They refuse to even listen to the sermon. They will not listen to it. Okay, so that's uh, Acts chapter 13, quoting out of Habakkuk chapter 1. He says, um, so take care lest it be uh, spoken of you what is written in the prophets. You scoffers and scorners marvel and perish and vanish away because I will do, the, do a deed in your day. Did I do the did I? <laughs> I will do a deed in your day which you will not believe even if someone clearly describes it in detail to you. Okay? So people cannot bear to listen to this message. People can't stand hearing this word. And yet God shows that this word of the cross of Christ is the word that will save them that believe. Okay. Our, uh, your forefather Abraham was extremely happy at the hope and the prospect of seeing my day and he saw it. Then the Jews said to him, you are not even 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? Jesus replied, I assure you most solemnly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. So they took up stones. True to their nature. <laughs> to, to throw at him. But Jesus, by mixing with the crowd, concealed himself and went out of the temple. All right. And then he found the man outside the temple, the blind man, sitting there, and he healed him. Okay. <laughs> How wonderful is he? He was. He was. They throw him with stones and chase him out of the temple because and reject him. They don't want to hear his teaching. And as he goes out, he heals someone who's born blind. Wow, that's just that's just amazing. That is just incredible. Okay, John chapter 14 says the following. Verse 21 it says, The person who has my commands and keeps them, or the person who has my words, my teachings, my precepts, that's what the word means. The person who has my commands and keeps them, it's not speaking of the Ten Commandments. It's speaking of the words of Jesus. Okay? The words of spirit and life. The person who has my commands and keeps them is the one who really loves me. And whoever really loves me will be loved by my Father. And I too will love him and will show, reveal, manifest myself to him. I will let myself be clearly seen by him and make myself real to him. So the more you come to him, believing his words that is being preached to you, the more you will experience that life, but the more he who is life will reveal and show himself to you. Verse 23, if a person really loves me, he will keep my word, obey my teaching, and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home abode, special dwelling place with him. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. If you come to him, believing his word, being drawn to him, he will never reject you. What he will do is he will come to you and he will abide and dwell inside you. Okay. John 15. Uh, Verse 7 says, if you live in me and my words remain in you and continue to live in your hearts, ask whatever you will and it shall be done for you. When you bear much fruit, my Father is honored and glorified and you show and prove yourselves to be true followers of mine. Okay. When we treasure the word 
And when we come to Him who is the Word, and when we seek Him out, the person, we will ask Him anything and it shall be done for us. Jesus could ask the Father anything because he, the Father had His heart. He was in the Father and the Father was in Him. If we abide in Him and He abides in us and His words remain us in, inside us and we constantly meditate on His Word and His Word dwells in us richly, Colossians chapter 3, then we can ask Him anything and He will do it for us. Okay? We will have what we ask. Okay? So um, it's about this relationship. It's about coming to the person. I want you to understand that the word that we're preaching to you is not just information. It's not just some new, you know, some newest revelation or what. It is revealing a person. It is him that's coming to you. The words that I'm speaking to you is the word of life. The words that I'm speaking to you is the person Christ. He is the word. The words that I'm speaking to you is the bread of life. And we partake of the bread of life by hearing and believing the word. All right. So I want to take communion with you. Okay. So you are there in your homes and, and I am here uh, in my garage <laughs> preaching to a camera, but preaching to all the people that is tuned in. And uh, I just want you to, to just get some bread and some juice or something together there. Um, just get something there, whatever you have in your home, I'll just give a minute or two. Just uh, get some, uh, whether it's a cracker or a bread or whatever you have, uh, or juice or wine, whatever it is. You can even use water, whatever you have. Um, and we're going to just have communion in a while. So just by a faith action, proclaiming what Jesus meant when he said, uh, this is my body broken for you, take and eat. All right, so uh, I'll give you a minute or two just to get your communion ready. I'll, I'll get something quickly on this side also. My wife was so, so awesome. When I started speaking about it, she started getting it ready. <laughs> so I just had to get the dogs out of the garage first again. <laughs> All right. So Jesus, on the night when he was treacherously betrayed, he took bread. That's 1 Corinthians 11. And he broke it. And he said... This is my body broken for you. He says, eat this in remembrance of me. Okay. Amplified. Do this to call me affectionately to remembrance. So, something that I've disagreed with, with the way some churches do it, but they, they are doing it and they're, they're doing it with the, with the right attitude and that's fine. But I want you to experience life, not to just do something so it's not really fine. Um, so 1 Corinthians 11, he says, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this to call me affectionately to remembrance. Please do not call your sins affectionately to remembrance. Please do not let your mind dwell on what you've done wrong now. Please do not 
invoke the idol of condemnation before the Lord now. Let us rather think of his body that was whipped on that cross. Uh, on, on the post, the cross that he, that he carried to Golgotha. Let us think of he, the nails that went through his hands. And the crown of thorns that's pressed into his head. And they hit him with a stick on his, in his face and on his head. They spat on him. Let us just think of the nails that went through his feet. And what an agonizing death he died. How he suffered on that cross. How he took upon himself the sins of the whole world. How he took upon himself that condemnation and death. Everything that I did wrong came upon him on that cross. Think on that. You say, take, this is my body. This word, everything that you're thinking about now. Jesus dying for us. Thinking affectionately about him carrying our sins on the cross. That is the bread of life. As I eat this bread. He declared, this is his body. I believe I'm eating his body. Thank you, Lord. And as I eat his body, I'm thinking of his body that was broken for me on that cross. The stripes that wounded him, that healed me. The chastisement that brought me peace. He was bruised for our iniquities. It's a table that the Lord sets in, in, in front of your enemies, Psalm 23. He decks a table for you. What's the table? It's the elements of the Lord. It's what Melchizedek brought to Abraham right in the beginning in Genesis. If you read Genesis 13, 14. Melchizedek brought bread and wine to Abraham. It's the body broken and his blood poured out. Verse 25. Similarly, when supper was ended... He took the cup also, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Matthew 26, verse 28, he also says it. Do this as often as you drink it. To call me affectionately to remembrance. So we, we take this cup and we think of how his blood flowed out of his body. How he was the spotless blameless lamb of god and how his blood was drained out of his body to pay for me to cleanse my conscience how all my guilt came upon him how his blood washed me clean white as snow white as wool how his blood made me holy and perfect and blameless how his blood means the forgiveness of my sins i've said this many times before this is like liquid forgiveness of the blood of Jesus. So you don't now think of everything you've done wrong and try it for weeks to, to get yourself right be, before you take the communion. No, you take the communion because this is the atoning sacrifice. It is as if I'm standing at the cross and drinking His blood. It is as if I'm standing at the cross and eating His flesh that's on, that's on that cross. Feasting on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. As the Passover lamb had to be eaten by the people. And the, and the blood had to be poured, uh, put on the doorposts. And the angel of death passed over them. So the angel of death passes over everyone who eats and drinks. The pure spotless lamb of God. His sins are truly forgiven, who, are, who is washed, whose clothes are washed in his blood, who is totally forgiven and cleansed and made holy and made righteous by the blood of, of Jesus Christ. Conscience cleansed, pure, holy, perfect, blameless. We think of that, not of our sins. What a distraction to be thinking of your sin while partaking of the communion. Verse 26, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are representing, proclaiming, 
It says here signifying the fact of the Lord's death until He comes again. We are celebrating and representing His death. Not, people say He's not on the cross, and He's not on the cross. But the crucified Christ is, is what we preach. We see Him on the cross. Paul said um, to the Galatian church in Galatians 3, he says, uh, you unto whom Christ was graphically set forth and portrayed as crucified. We need to have that image of Christ on the cross burned and etched into our minds. That is the bread of life. It's not in the grave anymore. <laughs> but Christ on the cross is our life. He is the bread of life. Do this... Uh, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are representing the, Lord, the fact of the Lord's death until He comes again. Um, so, I'm not going to spend time on this. But when He comes again, First Thessalonians 4 says, He will bring with Him those who are dead. So, the, on the last day there will be a resurrection, as we read in John chapter 6. And there's still a lot of people in the graves. There's still a, still a lot of dead people. That means he didn't come yet. He hasn't. You can't argue that he has come right now. He, because there's still people in graves. The last day in the resurrection can't be yet because there's still people in the graves. But he says, we proclaim this, the word of life. Until he comes again. So that means the more we look to the cross in this time that we are now, the more the manifestation of life will increase and the more uh, the church, the body of Christ will start to resemble and look like Christ and Christ appearing in his body. And only when he looks, when Christ, uh, when the body of Christ looks like Christ will he come back again. He says in the First John chapter 3, we know not what we shall be hereafter, but we know this, that when he comes, we will resemble him and be like him, for we shall see him as he really is. So that was just to answer this thing of until he comes again. Verse 27, So then whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in a way that's unworthy of him will be guilty of profaning and sinning against the body and the blood. The body and the blood is not meant for us to just to just ignore or to just have a ritual with. The body and the blood of the Lord is our life. It's meant for us to eat and drink. It's meant for us so that we might live. It's meant for us. We need to come to the cross and partake of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And we need to partake it in a worthy manner. The worthy manner is faith. 28. Let a man thoroughly examine himself, and only when he has done so should he eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For if anyone eats and drinks without discriminating and recognizing with due appreciation that it is Christ's body, eats and drinks a sentence upon himself. Not when you drink in an unworthy manner, oh, I, I kick the cat and now I'm drinking. No, it's not what he's saying. You need to understand that you're partaking of the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ. All right. That careless and unworthy participation is the reason many of you are weak and sickly and quite enough of you have fallen into the sleep of death. All right. So there is life in partaking of the bread of life. If we eat his flesh and drink his blood, knowing that it is his flesh and his blood, on purpose, intentionally, with, with intent, we eat and drink. With intent, we read the word and we, we take our life from the death of Christ. We will receive life and not perish. We will live and not die. We will experience life and our bodies will be restored to life. Our spirit and soul will be full of life. We will see the righteousness of God inside of us. We will uh, walk with a clear conscience. And we will be completely free, being set free by the truth of Jesus Christ. All right. So thank you guys for watching. Um, I hope this has meant something to you. As I'm standing here, my heart is burning with this word. 
and I experience uh, the, the power of God. I experience the goodness of Jesus, the, the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, thank you for watching with me. And may you just experience the life of the Lord Jesus Christ through this message in Jesus' name. Join us again tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock for a um, morning devotion. But, uh, and this afternoon at 4 o'clock also, uh, Rina will have her Sunday service on Burning Lights Ministries page. Do not miss it. You will really be blessed. Thank you for watching. Be blessed. Amen.